Well, good morning. Isn't it good to be here today? It's always good to come into the house of the Lord every time we have an opportunity to do so. But also we enjoy these times where we get to come together and celebrate special times. Celebrate this homecoming. And I appreciate so much the invitation to come and be with you today. As Brother David mentioned, it's been a while since you've been able to have a homecoming. I believe it was last year, maybe the year before, uh, David had called and invited me to come and speak for homecoming. And then COVID revved up again and weren't able to have it. And I regretted not being able to come then, but I'm so thankful to be able to be here today. And driving over, I got to thinking, well, I wonder how many people there'll be that I actually know. Because, you know, time passes by and life happens and so many members of this congregation that I knew and loved from many years ago have passed on. They've gone to be with the Lord and we look forward to the time that we'll be reunited with them. But I'm so glad to be able to look out and see many familiar faces, people that I do remember, even Tommy sitting back there. It's good to, uh, good to see Tommy this morning. But I'm not going to say a whole lot before we get into our Bible class. I have a lot that I want to try to get to this morning, but we'll talk a little bit more about some of my memories from Pine Knot when we get into the lesson later this morning. After the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, we find that almost immediately God began to promise that an anointed one who was, was going to come, who would redeem man back to a faithful state, would make it possible for their sins to be washed away and make it possible for them to have a right relationship with God. Well, throughout the Old Testament, we find those who are faithful to God watching for this promised Messiah. And as the time of his coming drew closer, we find that God began to send prophets with messages informing people who they needed to be looking for the type of person that this Messiah was going to be. Through the prophet Jeremiah, and I hope you have your Bible this morning because we're going to be looking at a lot of different passages. But through the prophet Jeremiah, God stated in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, and this is a passage that is probably going to be familiar to most of you. God says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now this passage, along with many others that we find in the Old Testament, are known as Messianic prophecies because they talk about the coming Messiah, what he was going to fulfill, who they needed to be looking for, what the kingdom was going to be like that he was going to establish. But we find that along the way, God's chosen nation, the Jews, they should have been the ones that were prepared to be the first fruits of Jesus' followers. They should have been the ones that were the most prepared, that were the most ready to accept him as the Messiah whenever he first came on the scene. As well, they should have been some of the first ones ready to enter into the kingdom when it came into establishment. But we find that by the time that Jesus came on the scene, the Jews had come to view the Messiah in more of a political light than a spiritual light. They weren't looking at him so much as a spiritual deliverer, but they were looking at, at someone that would be a great political leader, one that has great military might, because in their minds they had been led to believe that the reason the Messiah was coming 
was not to restore them to faithfulness with God, but was to drive out the Romans. They were under Roman oppression at this time, and the Jews wanted nothing more than to be set free from that. And so they had been persuaded, had been deceived into believing that that was the kind of leader that the Messiah was going to be. Well, as we come into the opening pages of the New Testament, we're introduced to a man by the name of John who came to be known as the baptizer. In Mark chapter 1, it's revealed that he was a forerunner of the promised Messiah and that the purpose of his ministry was to preach a doctrine of repentance, to help the Jews to realize that they had been deceived and to bring them back to a proper understanding of who the Messiah was really was going to be. Because God knew that the people were going to be deceived. God knew that if Jesus just came on the scene and began his ministry without the ministry of John preceding him, that there would be even fewer people who would realize who Christ was. Even fewer would accept him as this promised Messiah. But we can go back to Isaiah chapter 40 and we can see that God had a foreknowledge that these people were going to be deceived, that they were going to need this, uh, this prior ministry of John before the coming of Jesus because we read of John's role in Isaiah 40 verses 3 through 5 where it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted or brought up. Every mountain and hill shall be made low or cut down. And he goes on to say this. The crooked shall be made straight. The rough places plain. Simply put, what he's saying is that this person is going to come along and he's going to clear up the confusion. He's going to come along and he's going to make it where the, this, this journey of faith that a person has to be on in order to realize who Jesus is, it's not going to be as difficult because the valleys are going to be brought up, the hills are going to be cut down. And interestingly enough, the imagery that he was using there came from an ancient practice that would often take place when royalty was going to travel. They would send people ahead of them to smooth out the roads. And there were even instances where certain rulers were so intense in this that they, they would actually have mountains cut down. They would actually have valleys filled in because they wanted their ease of travel. And so this was the imagery that God is using here through Isaiah to talk about what John was going to do. He was going to clear all of this up. And teach them that they needed to repent. They needed to turn away from their false views of who the Messiah was. So that they would recognize him when he come. Well in Luke 3 verses 4 and 6. We find where John declares himself to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. And in Luke 3 and verse 15. He's already told them that he's the fulfillment of this prophecy about the forerunner. But yet, by the time we come to verse 15, we see that the people are still not comprehending exactly what his ministry is. Because many of them were looking at John saying, well, this must be the Messiah. He must be the one that we're looking for. But when John heard what the people was thinking, in verses 16 and 17, he answered and he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come at the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is, is, <clears throat> whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So John He's told the people, he says, yes. He says, I've come. I'm baptizing people with a baptism of repentance. He said, but there's someone else coming that I'm not even worthy to be compared with. He says, I'm coming to prepare you for the coming of someone else. Well, it's interesting to me 
that the very next day, John 1 verses 29 through 34 reveal this to us. The very next day, after John told the people that he was not the Messiah. It says that he looked up and he saw Jesus coming unto him. And paraphrasing, he says, there he is. This is the one that I've been telling you about. This is the man that you need to be following. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of of the world he says this is he this is the one of whom I said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me and I knew him not but that he should be made manifest to Israel therefore I am come baptizing with water and John bare record saying I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him and I knew him not But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. You notice what John has done. John has now declared to the assembled masses for the first time who the Messiah is. For the first time, A public proclamation has been made, and who better to make that proclamation than the one who was the forerunner of Christ? He says, this is the Son of God. This is the one that you've been looking for. Well, following the baptism of Jesus and his 40 days of being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus began his earthly ministry. And the teachings that he gave to those that were around him left no doubt as to who he really is. Left no doubt that he is the Messiah and what his ministry was to entail. He stated in John 5 and verse 25, he says, Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. He said, now is the time. This is taking place right now. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that shall hear him shall live. Well, drawing the people's minds all the way back to Eden, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, Jesus reveals that he indeed is that anointed one that God has promised. He indeed is the one that has come to take away the sins of the world. And he is the one that has come to establish his kingdom. Now, throughout Jesus' ministry, one of the main themes of uh, the messages that he would proclaim was the kingdom and how the kingdom was to come and the importance of being a part of the kingdom of God. We read in Matthew 4 and verse 23 where it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Then we find Jesus beseeching his disciples in that very common passage in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 where he says, But seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom. But then we see him even addressing those who would claim to be Christians when they really weren't measuring up to that standard. When he said in Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Not everyone that believes they're a Christian is measuring up to that standard. They're not living their life the way that they should. Now it is a fact that some of our religious neighbors would have us to believe that the church is not really the kingdom. That the church is just some type of an afterthought that came about because the Jews rejected Christ. But Jesus destroys that reasoning. In John 18 and verse 36 when he says, My kingdom is not of this world. Well, they believe, our our religious neighbors, many of them believe that this kingdom is going to come and that it's going to be an earthly kingdom. That Christ is going to reign on earth over that earthly kingdom for a thousand years. 
Well, Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. It's not going to be established here. Jesus is not going to reign over it with a physical presence, literally seated upon the throne of David. No, that's not how it's going to be. This kingdom is one that was to have a tremendous impact upon the world, but it was not going to be a part of this world. But then the question that we need to look at, well, who is this kingdom for? Who was it created to benefit? Well, the answer is found in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Folks, the kingdom is for those who Christ redeems. And Christ redeems those who will come to him in obedience to the gospel. So every person that is willing to obey the gospel, that is who the kingdom has been established for. Every person has the ability to be a part of that kingdom. Well, as it was drawing closer to the time that Jesus was to go to the cross, he was speaking with his disciples and informing them about what was going to transpire telling them that it was going to fall upon them to carry the mantle of his ministry, to continue to reach out to the lost. But there were many who still wanted to know, when is this kingdom going to come? When is it going to take place? Well, you remember in Mark 9 and verse 1, that question was asked, and Jesus said, there are some of you, paraphrasing, there are some of you that are standing here today that are not going to taste death until the kingdom comes. He said there are some who will still be alive when the kingdom comes into establishment. And so once again, looking at what those around us who claim that the kingdom has not come, how can they rationalize that view with what Jesus says that there were some still alive there near the beginning of the first century who would not taste of death until the kingdom comes? The kingdom has come. It is the church. Well, following Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he spent 40 days with his disciples, speaking to them things pertaining to the kingdom. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 tell us this. But just prior to his ascension, we see that his disciples still had some confusion about the kingdom. They still really didn't fully comprehend how this was going to come about, what it was going to be. And so they asked the question there in Acts 1, verses 6 through 8. said, Lord, at this time, it is now when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You're about to leave us, you're about to ascend back to heaven. Is now the time when the kingdom is going to come? So see, they still did not fully understand But I love Jesus' response. He said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. He said, This is something that God has put into motion. God knew when the appropriate time was going to be. God knew when the kingdom was going to come. And Jesus says, Now is not the time for you to know. But He says, But you will know the time because you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Well, then we come to the exciting events of Acts chapter 2. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning. So you don't have to be flipping around in your Bible as much. Uh, If you want to open to Acts chapter 2, this is where we're going to be the rest of the time. Here we find the fulfillment of the prophecies that we noted earlier from Jeremiah as well as some that Christ had delivered as well. Because here we're going to see the kingdom come with power. Let's begin reading in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven 
as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, following this receipt of the Spirit, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, we see that the apostles, they began, as it says, to speak in other tongues, to speak in other languages, that which was not natural to them. And they went out, and Peter stood up with the eleven, and he began to preach the gospel to those Jews that had gathered in Jerusalem on that day, Jews from many different nations of the earth. They had come to celebrate the day of Pentecost. And Peter and the eleven, they stood up and they began to preach. And as Peter preached to them, their hearts were pricked by the message. The word of God that was being proclaimed convicted the hearts of the Jews. They recognized that they were in sin. They recognized that they were guilty of crucifying the Son of God. Well, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we rectify this lost state that we're in? Have you ever realized that up to this point, there really wasn't much they could do? Yes, they could offer their sacrifices as instructed under the old law. They could carry those over from year to year. But there was nothing they could do to actually be set free from the guilt of their sins. But now, Peter says you can repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. What a powerful message. The first time that the invitation was extended, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.41 tells us they that gladly received this word. Notice that this is telling us that there were some that heard this that didn't like it. There were some that heard the message that Peter proclaimed and they didn't want to hear that. But those that gladly received it, that were prepared, that wanted to hear the gospel, they were baptized in the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Folks, the kingdom had come. And it had come in a powerful way. I don't know about you, but I have never experienced anything like seeing 3,000 people baptized into Christ in one day. In fact, I think the most that I have ever seen in one day was four. But a while back, I had a fellow preacher that came to me, and he brought me a photo. And I believe this photo was taken somewhere uh, in the Philippines. And it was a photo of people standing on the seashore and you could see that there were some out in the water being baptized and he said do you know what this is I said no he said some missionaries baptized 3,000 people in one day in the Philippines that was powerful folks that's something that we're not accustomed to seeing in this country but there are places in the world where people are still that hungry for the gospel that want to come to Christ and they're doing so in droves but think about this with me as we continue on through the next couple of chapters in the book of Acts we see that the Lord's church continued to grow rapidly by the time we get to Acts 4 and verse 4 we're told that the number of saved men this does not include the women the number of saved men was 5,000. Now, if the demographic of the church in those days was similar to the demographic of the church today, when you add the women in, it was probably closer to fifteen or 20,000. Because it has nearly always been the case that there were more women who were a part of the body of Christ than men. In fact, I've only worked with one congregation where there was even close to a 50% 
of, of men and women who made up the congregation. But we see that within just a short period of time, the church had grown exponentially. And continuing on, we move roughly 20 years down the line. And we see Paul writing in Colossians 1 and verse 23. He says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, notice this, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now the first time that I read this, and you may feel this way as well when you read this, I looked at this and I thought, that doesn't seem logical the way that that reads. That by this time that every creature on earth, every person on earth, had had an opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ. Well, I want to share with you a statement that Brother David Lipscomb made many years ago about this verse. He said, it seems strange that the gospel had been preached among all the nations. But if we consider the earnest character of the Christians who gloried in persecutions and death for Christ's sake, it will not seem so strange. But then he goes on. And I think there's so much truth in this statement, both in the 1800s when Brother Lipscomb wrote this, as well as today. He said, the greatest hindrance to the gospel in our day is the lukewarm and indifferent character of professed Christians. I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. Folks, Christianity took the first century world by storm. And it's been estimated that by the end of the first century, just 77 years, that 25% of the world's population had obeyed the gospel. 25%. Now consider this with me for just a moment. We're getting short of time, and I've only got through about half of what I wanted to say. But consider this with me for just a moment. Today we have greater resources than the first century church. We have more ease of travel. We have God's complete word compiled for us in a convenient book form. But yet, there are nations on this earth today where there is not a single child of God. not a single Christian. Folks, we need to do better. We need to find ways to reach out. No, we may not be able to go to these other nations, but you better believe that we can make an impact on our nation. That we can reach out to those who are around us. Because there are still people in the United States. There are still people in Greene County, Arkansas. There are still people in the Pine Knot community that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are still people that are just waiting for someone with a kind and loving dispensation that cares for their soul to come to them and share the gospel of Christ with them. But who's going to do it if we don't? That's our message. That is our charge. But sometime, I want you to do something for me. And we don't have time to go through this this morning. But sometime when you have an opportunity, I want you to take out your Bible, and I want you to read Acts 2, 42 through 47. Because it is my opinion that what we see provided in these few short verses was the divine blueprint that led to the church growing so rapidly there in the first century. And a few things that I want to point out to you, and we'll close for this morning. These are the things that I want you to notice whenever you read these verses. Folks, first we see that these Christians, they were addicted to the gospel. They were addicted to the things that they were hearing, the things that they were engaging in. But what was it that they were addicted to? They were addicted to the apostles' doctrine. 
the things that they were hearing. They were taking advantage of every opportunity that came up to hear the gospel. But folks, we can't even get our own members, those who have already obeyed the gospel, we can't even get all of them to attend Sunday night and Wednesday night services. Do you remember how excited you were when you first became a Christian? You felt like you were invincible. You couldn't get enough of the gospel. You wanted to be active. You wanted to do everything that you could. Do you still have that zeal? Do you still have that fire in your bones? If not, why not? We need to get back to that. But also we see that they enjoyed a fellowship with each other. They enjoyed being together. We get in then to some of the worship practices. They broke bread together, talking about the observance of the Lord's Supper. They were a prayerful people. But one that I think that is so important that many Christians have got away from today, folks, they stood in awe of God. In fact, whenever you look at the passage here in Acts chapter 2, folks, they were seeing things, they were hearing things that mankind had never seen before. They were in awe of God, the power of God, the love and the mercy of God. They stood in awe of that. We too. Whenever we consider what God has done for us and what He will do for us in the future, we too need to stand in awe of God. They were benevolent people. The passage says that they had all things in common. Some of them sold their possessions. And this is not talking about that they lived in poverty. But what it was saying, what it's talking about, is that there were those who were seeing things that they had that weren't being used, that weren't being beneficial to them, and that by selling those things that it would be more beneficial to their brothers and sisters in Christ, to those who were in need. You know, we have the example of of Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 who had a piece of land that was really useless to him after he became a Christian. And he took and he sold that piece of property and he brought the money and he gave it to the needy saints. When they saw a need among their brothers and sisters, they were willing to provide for it, whatever it took. But also, and we're wrapping up, they became true disciples of Christ. They were happy to be Christians. They found favor with all the people and they were fruitful. The church grew because of the way that they were living, because of the example that they were setting. Thank you for your attention this morning.